Welcome to this evening's lecture. This is the first in the annual programme of lectures organised by the Edinburgh and South East Scotland Institute of Mechanical Engineers. Our first talk is entitled From Airships to the Space Race and reviews some of the technical contributions by women engineers to a variety of um, a variety of technologies that are now incorporated in um, aerospace. Our speaker is Dr. Nina Baker, who's had a varied career. She started as a Merchant Navy deck officer, gaining a certificate of competency as first mate of a foreign going vessel. After she left the Navy, she studied at the University of Warwick and got a degree in engineering before going on to Liverpool University where she got a PhD on the durability of concrete. Later, she moved to Glasgow, where she's worked in further education and local government. And now retired, she researches the history of women and engineering, uh, women in engineering and promotes engineering as a career option for girls. So this, today she's going to share with us some of the, uh, some of the contributions she's discovered that have been made by women. And she'll start her presentation by talking about the, uh, the Weaning family, um, who are some of the, the first examples of um, female innovation in the aerospace industry. Yes. Here you can see the Vineling ladies um, processing gold beater skin, which is made from um, the intestines of cows. And here they're washing it and stretching it over the backs of chairs to stretch it out. And it's stuff that um, kind of behaves a bit like uh, small pieces of cling film. Next, please. Um, and you can see in the top left hand picture um, a soldier being instructed in how to use this stuff because it was used to make the gas envelopes for balloons that were used for spying purposes um, during the Boer War. And although the balloons were sent out ready made, um, the soldiers in the field had to know how to patch them up if they got holes. This stuff continued to be used because it was very lightweight. Um, but it was really awkward to make. Um, you needed an awful lot of cows to make enough gold beater skin to stick together to make um, an airship balloon, airship gas bag. And in the bottom right hand picture, you can see women during the First World War preparing gold beater skin, this time not at the Royal Aircraft Establishment, but at um, the Short Brothers Airship Works. Um, and to give you an idea of how many cows you need, to make something the size of one of the Zeppelins, you'd need something of the order of a quarter of a million um, cow guts, all carefully prepared like this, and then overlapped to make uh, the gas envelope. Next, please. And here you can see Bottom right, these are women uh, from the very first version of the Women's Royal Air Force inside a gas balloon, patching it up, making repairs. And in the top left hand picture, this rather charming um, painting um, of the uh, preparation of a gas balloon uh, for one of the big airships. And this is a, a picture by Sir William <laughs> Russell Flint. Um, at, at the Beardmore Airship Works in Scotland. Next, please. So still sticking with airships, at the end of the First World War, quite a number of women who had gained maths degrees were recruited to the Royal Aircraft Establishment to help with the endless amount of maths that was required. Um, and such a woman was Hilda Lyons. She was actually sent um, to the Royal Aircraft Works at Cardington um, to help with the stress calculations for the transverse frames of 
the R101 airship. Um, and here you can see that, that structure being put together. Um, she worked there uh, for a little while, um, and in fact, it got to go up in the R101 before she went off on the maiden flight, in which, of course, it was sadly um, destroyed. Next, please. By the time the R101 was actually burning out um, at Beauvais outside uh, Paris, Hilda Lyon was at MIT in America um, taking a, a master's um, degree um, and her thesis was the effect of turbulence on the drag of airship models. And the reason she was doing this was it had become apparent in the early uh, forms of wind tunnels that the uh, the result the wind tunnel results bore no resemblance to what happened in real life and she wanted to find out why and amongst other things she discovered that the turbulence caused by the structures used to support the models was causing problems and various kinds of baffles had to be introduced but the outcome of, of her uh, research um, next please was to discover what the different drag coefficients of different shapes of airships were. And she made a surprising um, discovery. It was originally thought that um, streamlining meant that the, the front end of an airship had to be very, very pointy in order to reduce um, air resistance. But she discovered, and I'm quoting from her thesis, with the assumption that two ships of the same volume and the same fineness ratio will have the same drag, in considering the speed and required horsepower, there is nothing to choose between the two shapes. From the structural point of view, the shape with the higher block coefficient has a definite advantage as it provides a greater gas volume in the nose and tail to balance the concentrated weights of the mooring equipment and the fins, thus relieving the static bending moments on the hull and reducing the structural weight. As the structural weight in modern rigid airships is about 65% of the total lift requirement, a saving of 10% on the structural weight means an increase of nearly 20% in the useful load and probably 65% in the payload. So what she discovered was that actually a bluffer shape, a rounder shape of airship um, was more efficient and more effective. And this came to be known as the lion shape. Next, please. When she came back from America, she went almost immediately to Germany. Um, this is in the early 1930s by this point. And she went to work as a research assistant for Ludwig Prandtl at Göttingen. Uh, Lud Lud Ludwig Prandtl was the foremost expert in both hydrodynamics and aerodynamics. And here you can see him with an early form of simple test tank. He was also Although he was a Nazi sympathizer, which saved him his job as the Nazis rose to power, he was also somewhat surprisingly something of a, a supporter of women um, in science and engineering. And Hilda Lyon was by no means the only talented uh, woman mathematician and engineer to work in his laboratories, as we'll see later. Um, she returned to the Royal Aircraft, to, to Britain, and eventually got a job at the Royal Aircraft Establishment. Next, please. Um, just before the war, she got a job in 1937, and by which time everybody knew war was coming and they were preparing for it. Um, she did various uh, jobs at the Royal Aircraft Establishment during the war, and at the very end of the war, um, after the armistice, um, she was one of a number of people who were sent um, as a team back to Göttingen, so somewhere she knew, to interview the remaining scientists and basically to box up and steal all their equipment because it was known that Germany, Germans uh, wind tunnels um, and other aeronautical um, aerodynamic equipment was far superior to ours. And she wrote this report about the visit to, to Volkenroder and Göttingen, um, recommending various um, technologies and, and research work that had been done, including um, work on swept wings, which we'll come back to at the end of this talk. Next, please. 
Unfortunately, um, Hilda died rather young um, of a botched um, surgical operation. And this paper on the left, uh, a theoretical analysis of longitudinal di dynamic stability in gliding flight was her last publication and also the most cited in, in, in later times. It's still occasionally cited in a variety of fields, including um, submarine design and even biomimetics. And what she was working on um, was the behavior of aircraft um, in what's known as fugoid action. And that's where um, aircraft can get into a kind of standing wave where they go up and down and up and down, um, and it needs to be stabilized or else they'll crash. Um, and fugoid flight um, is something that is built into the software that controls airplanes today. The submarine in the top right hand picture is the USS Albacore, it's now a museum ship, and it is one of the class of American submarines that was built using what they call the lion shape based on her uh, original research. Um, I'm glad to say she now has a blue plaque of her own in her hometown in Yorkshire. Um, she, she was born in Market Wheaton and we got a plaque put up to her last year. Next, please. So we've been talking about Germany and this is Dr. Ilse Essers. Um, she was born Ilse Koba, almost uh, born, born only two years after Hilda Lyon, and in some ways had a similar type of career to Hilda, but lived a lot longer. She was the daughter of Theodore Kober, who was the airship designer for Graf Zeppelin. Um, he then founded his own um, company called Flugzeugbau, meaning airplane building, uh, at Friedrichshafen in 1912. And a couple of years later, um, Ilsa joined her father and became an apprentice in the design office. She then qualified and became a technician. Um, and after the First World War, she took a degree at Munich in what they called technical physics and continued to work in various aerodynamics offices. She was an assistant um, in the Aerodynamics Institute in Aachen um, and then worked for um, the German Aeronautics Center. She took a, degree, a, a PhD, um, again, this is just before the war, the second war. Next, please. And her work um, at the Technical Hochschule um, was on the mass balance uh, required to overcome flutter in wings and particularly wing flaps and rudders. Um, and this, this bottom picture, bottom left hand picture, is the little wind tunnel that she used for that. Um, she married another aeronautics engineer and re retired um, into married life, but he was um, engaged in various forms of contract engineering and she sometimes was involved with helping him. Next, please. I can't very well talk about uh, women in aeronautical engineering without mentioning Beatrice Schilling, who very likely is the one person that most people have heard of if they haven't heard of any of the other women in this sort. And Beatrice Schilling um, has become best known for her solution to the problem of uh, the Spitfire Merlin engines in the Second World War which kept cutting out um, due to the carburetor um, flooding when they were in a dive. And she devised this, uh, what's known as um, the RAE uh, float, um, which basically something crossed between a, a washer and a funnel, which restricted the flow of, of fuel in the carburetor so that the engines didn't cut out. Next, please. So after the war, as we know, um, a lot of technology was taken um, from Germany and brought to Britain and America and of course Russia. A lot of rocket technology and a lot of it was relating to the V2, V2 uh, rockets, uh, V2 bomb, bombs, sorry. 
um, and taken some of it was taken to this Welsh um, testing range where women were kept on after the war in the ATS to help with the radar tracking as, as they, they were tested. Next, please. And now I want to bring you back to Beatrice Schelling again because her work on the Merlin engines in the Second World War was by no means the only thing she did. She was um, the, fuel, the motor and fuel expert, um, fuel supply expert for the Royal Aircraft Establishment. And one of the jobs she was asked to look at was the fuel supply for this transonic rocket. Um, this tiny little model of, of a rocket was made and was launched um, from underneath a mosquito plane. And she did the work on the fuel supply for this. Next, please. A lot of these rockets um, were tested um, by launching from the Mosquito over the sea near the Scilly Isles, but the problem with that was most of these rockets blew up and then it all fell in the sea and you had nothing left to test. Um, and they eventually they brought the tests back onto land and the picture in the bottom right is Beatrice Schilling with her, her team who were working on the ramjet engines for some of these rockets after a successful test of down at the pump having a pint. Next, please. They had a lot of trouble devising a way of testing um, these rockets, these ramjets um, on land, and they went through a, a, a number of different, what were called jet, jet test vehicles, JTVs, and that's what you're looking at in the top left-hand picture. These rocket launching ramps to test the ramjets. Um, they eventually devised one that worked, but that by the time they were on version number eight, and that's what the, the pub outing was celebrating, this one that's successful. So these ramjets, um, JTV ramjets, um, were being used mainly for uh, missiles um, because they're, they're very lightweight form of propulsion. And here we can see the Bloodhound um, in the cutaway picture and uh, in its launching uh, mode. And the Bloodhound ground to air missile, which used ramjet propulsion, was in use up to the 1990s, a very successful um, small missile. So there was a lot of crossover between rockets um, that were used for space and rockets for missiles. And quite a lot of women um, worked on um, these types of, of early rockets that had that crossover. Not all of them at the Royal Aircraft Establishment, some of them were in industry. Next, please. So here we have just two such women, Joan Lavender on the left, um, who uh, worked for what we now think of as a British Aerospace, but it was de Havilland's when she first joined them. And she worked in their guided missile division. She was one of these women who got into this by sheer talent. She had no degree. She worked her way up from an apprentice um, and became, um, she was in charge of very early computer aided design uh, manufacturing division. Um, she worked on the Blue Streak and on the Excalibur guided artillery shell. I think it's a Blue Streak she's sitting on, but I'm not absolutely sure. Uh, Peggy Hodges on the right um, was a president of the Women's Engineering Society. She worked for GEC and she was project manager for their guided weapons um, department. Um, she worked on um, the Red Dean. Uh, missile, which is the bottom picture, and the Sea Dart, which was a, a sea to air missile uh, for the Royal Navy, um, which is the top picture. Next, please. So the space race was going on in parallel with this, um, and a lot of this work was going to and fro, but we didn't have anywhere to launch rockets. So anything worked on in Britain had to be shipped out to Woomera in Australia to be launched. And when it got there, um, there were teams of women um, doing the tracking um, so that 
the picture on the top right is two women with what's known as a kinney theodolite. So it's a theodolite with a, with a cine film camera embodied in it. This is something that was developed during the Second World War and was in use right up until we had automated radar tracking for uh, rockets. And the women in the bottom picture are one of the latest um, versions of the wo woman as a computer. This was, this was a team of computers. Um, and these were women in Australia who worked at Woomera doing the um, calculations but that were extracted from the tracking systems. And the, the woman marked with the red arrow was uh, Mary Whitehead, and she was in charge of the women computers. Um, the Black Knight uh, was a launch vehicle which was used to test re-entry vehicles for the Blue Streak. Um, Black Arrow was also a satellite, was used a satellite launch vehicle um, which was derived from both the Blue Streak and the Black Knight. Um, there was a whole load of these um, rockets and missiles with these colour names and there's a Wikipedia page which explains them all. Very complicated. Next please. So there you see the blue streak, and we're back to Beatrice Schilling again. Um, she was put in charge of um, develop, well, actually designing and installing, commissioning, and working with a high altitude test plant, which was part of which was to test the boil off test rig for the blue streak oxygen tank um, at the Royal Aircraft Establishment. Um, and, and she built all of that, and it was probably amongst the largest uh, project she had towards the end of her life, although she did do some work on um, runways suitable for um, the uh, space shuttle, before we had the space shuttle, but when they were thinking of one. Next, please. So engineering um, in aerospace isn't just about rockets and aeroplanes. Um, a lot of work was done at the Royal Aircraft Establishment on human engineering, um, keeping, keeping the pilots alive. As soon as aeroplanes started to go high enough and fast enough that oxygen and pressure were an issue, um, the Royal Aircraft Establishment did a lot of work on early pressure suits. And here we see Helen Grimshaw. Um, she joined the Royal Aircraft Establishment almost immediately after the First World War. She was one of the first women to work there, um, again a mathematician originally. She was originally, um, she was in charge of um, the operations side of, of the wind tunnels, but she moved over to do work on um, oxygen supply and pressure suits. And here this picture is her at her retirement when her, one of her retirement presents uh, was a model of, of this suit, which is known as the Haldane suit. But she also did um, work on the, um, the, the, the troop carrying glider tugs that we used, uh, for instance, to take troops for um, the Arnhem landings and that kind of thing. Um, she produced a book, which I have yet to find, um, which was a manual on all aspects of flying and towing these troop carrying glider tugs. Next please. Um, she worked a good deal with Kate Maslin on, on the design of suits and also the design of helmets. Um, she was working on oxygen design and communications um, support as the helmets got more and more complicated. Also um, on the effect of noise and vibration on uh, human performance um, under duress. Next, please. Um, equivalent sort of work going on um, it, at, at NASA um, that um, we, we forget sometimes that textiles are part of engineering too. Uh, famously, during the Apollo program, uh, hot hardware had to be sewn into um, to make what we would now call software by threading wires through holes to create the programming for spacecraft. And on the right, you can see um, a woman who is an expert seamstress preparing uh, shield 
um, preparing the thermal blankets for heat shielding at NASA and the, the design and construction of heat shielding and space suits continues to be a very important um, aspect. Next, please. Um, almost from the first, um, but not generally much known, women have been involved as flight test observers and flight test engineers. One of the last of them before the, the Royal Aircraft Establishment packed up was this woman, Sue Adcock, who's still alive, still with us. And she started off as a flight test observer. Um, and she also was working on the design of pressure suits and anti-G suits. It was discovered that she had a particular resistance to the effects of high gravity. And so they trained her up to actually fly these high-speed fighter jets long before uh, women were flying fighter jets in the RAF. She was a civilian. Um, so this is her uh, flying one of these jets. Um, she also um, did a lot of testing herself in the centrifuge, um, testing anti-G suits for use in the typhoons up, up to 9G. Next, please. As well as military work, the uh, Royal Aircraft Establishment did a lot of work on civil, civil aviation, um, design and checking what had gone wrong if there were accidents and those of you of a certain age may recall that the, the, the many fatal crashes of the Comet airliners in the 1950s um, when to begin with it was thought it was attributed to um, pilot error. Next please. And if you care to get a copy of this delightful James Stewart film based on a Neville Shute story called No Highway in the Skies is a fictionalized version of how, how it was discovered that the comets were crashing. Next. What, how it was actually discovered was that um, the people at the Royal Aircraft Establishment um, did in-flight tests and on the ground tests to see what was going wrong. And Anne Burns and Kate Maslin um, devised the first ever in-flight stress testing system and this middle picture at the bottom is the test station on a comet. So they went up in the comet with all these stress gauges that they'd put in place and the comet was put through its paces to try and reproduce um, what happened when the accidents occurred. Um, and uh, it probably, you probably know that um, it was discovered to be a fatigue issue. Next, please. Um, in addition to um, the work on the comets, Anne's principal claim to fame was the discovery of another series of accidents, the problem, the, the reason why another series of accidents was taking place. And these were um, a series where airplanes are just dropping out of the sky. Um, and it, she discovered that it was something called clear air turbulence, which you expect turbulence in clouds, but this was happening in clear weather where you couldn't see that there was any problem at all. And she discovered that the cause was this clear air turbulence, which occurs when two jet streams are moving in opposite directions and create a differential between them, causing turbulence and airplanes just drop out of the sky. Um, she became the world expert in this and um, it's something that wasn't at all understood until um, the 1960s and 70s when she worked on this. Next please. And you will recall that um, I mentioned that Hilda Lyon went to Germany, to Göttingen, and recruited people um, and surveyed the research that was going on there. And one of the people that was recruited from Göttingen was another woman who had been a student of Prandtl's, Joanna Weber. And she came over with other workers from Göttingen, Volkenröder. And the reason that they were asked to come is for their expertise in swept wing aeroplane design, which was something that the British had no real expertise on. And she went on 
to do work on the design of the VC-10 wings, Concorde wings, and even Airbus 300B wings. Um, I think she's an interesting person to end on um, because you know she had work, she was working on things, aeroplanes of a kind that many of us will have travelled on. And it was only when she died that um, colleagues were trying to put together an obituary that they started to realise how much knowledge was being lost of the women who did really important work at the Royal Aircraft Establishment and in industry. Um, I suppose that reflects what I've been trying to do um, in putting together some of these stories. Um, and when we return to the screen, you'll see that I have behind me um, copies of a book that I have published about Hilda Lyon, and I'm hoping that it may be that there is um, sufficient knowledge now to, to write, to publish more about some of these other women who contributed so much to aircraft design and safety in the 20th century. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. That was fascinating. Um, and I'll stop sharing and see we can ambitiously now attempt to have some questions. Um, would people like to either use this a, a chat function or you could um, speak up or raise your hand if you have. A... I could start off. There was one while you were speaking, I wondered whether, how much we knew about the background to these women. How had they uh, gained their engineering knowledge? Had they come through a traditional university degree route? Or it it varies quite a lot. Of, of the women I've spoken about, the vast majority um, came to it as mathematicians. Beatrice Schilling um, started her career as an apprentice uh, to a woman engineer called Margaret Partridge, um, building um, direct current power stations in the southwest of England. Um, it was spotted that she was very bright, and the Women's Engineering Society um, found money and scholarships for her to go to Manchester University and do a mechanical engineering degree. And that's quite unusual. Most of the other women like Hilda Lyon, um, Helen Grimshaw, Kate Maslin, they all came to it via having done maths rather than engineering. And then basically um, they had to be turned into engineers. Hilda, um, in, a, in a talk that she gave to the Women's Engineering Society, made the point that she really missed not having that practical knowledge early on. And if she'd had her time again, she said she would have after her maths degree, she would have gone to a technical college and spent a few months learning about lathes and that kind of thing. Okay. You see, uh, Concur's got a, a question? Yeah, um, I was actually a follow-up question to that. I was just wondering, um, you know, um, how many of the women actually felt that absence of a, of a technical background? and whether they felt that it actually held them back or was it something that they, coming from a mathematical background, is it something they, they were able to make up over the course of their career? Or Well, it's really hard to know. Um, of the women that I have shown you, um, we, know the mo we know the most about um, Beatrice Schilling and Anne Burns because very good books were written about them. Uh, we know quite a lot about Ilse Esser because she almost uniquely wrote her own autobiography. So we know quite a lot about her. And she was, uh, she, she took, took a degree later on, having started off in the drawing office. And she made comments that you know, she made loads of mistakes because she didn't know anything like, like any apprentice. Um, we don't know really enough about the others because we don't have things that they wrote about their own experience, anything like half enough. So it's hard to know. Um, some, some women um, like um, Joan Lavender never had degrees at all. So they, they were purely practical and had to um, kind of uh, make their natural talent for maths and engineering um, get them through. 
would you would, would you say that there were that women gained more prominence in in aerospace compared to other sectors and was there any reason for that well i would say that then and now numbers of women in engineering in britain are generally embarrassing um, sure. but they tend to be clustered in aerospace and defense electronics okay and i think i mean i'm guessing but i think that's because those were two new industries that didn't bring with them a whole load of antique cultural baggage um, no offense to imec e and the civils and all the rest of it but they thought of themselves as quite traditional and had got a good deal of um, sort of old fashioned ideas, uh, particularly in industry. You know, no, no woman could order a man around, this kind of thinking. But in aerospace and uh, defense electronics, there'd been women involved from the get go. And so it was a bit more sympathetic, I think. I, I'm guessing, you know, statistics are hard to say, but. Do you, do you think there are any lessons there for us today? Sometimes I end talks of this kind with the embarrassing statistics, uh, which shows that Britain um, has the lowest proportion of women engineers in the whole of Europe and is only eighth from the bottom globally. And when you look at the countries that have the highest, the, the, the most, most close to equal numbers, um, it's embarrassing because a lot of them are Muslim majority countries or Eastern European countries. Um, it is entirely cultural. There is no other explanation fits for people to say, oh, well, women don't go into engineering because they don't go into engineering. And then you look at these other countries when they do, well, you know, what's different about their women compared to our women? <laughs> what can you say other than there must be something cultural going on? So I can see Andrew Gould has a, a question, but I wonder whether you felt it had just been answered, Andrew. You were asking, uh, how are we doing with regard to women in aeronautics today? But I think we just had. I, I can't give you statistics on aeronautics in particular, um, but in general, um, the numbers, numbers are pretty healthy in aeronautics and, and um, electronics, defense electronics in particular. Yes, it's been my experience for women as many others, of course, they follow role models and uh, the clustering that you mentioned could well be partly due to that as well. If, if they get an inspired lecturer or uh, somebody that inspires them, then you will get a, a cluster of others following into that. Uh, Absolutely. And part of the reason I do this is that young women are still being told when they're you know, still at school and they think, oh, I might do engineering. They're still being told, oh, that's really unusual. Or women started doing that in the 70s, didn't they, when feminism came in. And I want to show that this is something that um, women have been doing for longer. And therefore, there is a whole range of role models of all kinds, at all levels, technician, up, all the way up. Because... Very few of us are going to be astronauts, um, no matter who our role models might be. And there are excellent opportunities for people, not, not just at, um, by the university route, but technician route as well. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Um, yep. so just, Dave, um, Dave Hart has a question, I think. Yeah, it was just an observation actually. Um, a few years ago, we did a, a presentation at a girls' school about engineering and was one of the parents who grabbed a daughter and said see I told you it was about making things and just walked out along <laughs> 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 with making things you know for a start and it, um, the other side of it is um, I mean even as even as a bloke if you're in engineering you, you're almost classified as a, as a fitter or a mechanic there's nothing wrong with being that but the term engineer in itself is bad and from a purely selfish side of things, I genuinely think until we get about 50% women in engineering, it's never going to be viewed as a profession in this country anyway. Um, as I said, that's a rather selfish motive. But I, I genuinely think that's the state. And I, I worked in the offshore industry for the, well, 20, 30 years, really. And most of the girls who came into that, and there were quite a few, were all good. 
they were all excellent at dealing with blokes offshore. Um, they didn't take any nonsense from anybody. They were more than happy to go and to jump in with the lads and all the rest of it. And eventually we ran out of graduates coming because we just didn't get anybody apply for jobs. No girls. It was such a shame because all the ones who started with us did so well. Um, probably because they were a little bit unique, I suppose, in one sense. It was still a very male-dominated industry. Um, but the ones who made it really made it good. I mean, it was a very great pleasure working with them. I mean, I mean you, you, hit the, you hit the nail on the head, Joe, when you said at the beginning of that comment, um, you know, some people think of an engineer as a mechanic or a fitter. Um, and that is a uniquely British problem. Mm. It's part of the cultural difficulty I was mentioning, <coughs> is that, you know, in, in Germany, um, you take your life in your hands if you haven't um, ad addressed the, the person in front of you as Frau Doctor Engineer or whatever it might be, um, because it's an important status. I had the opportunity to um, visit Syria before the war, and I asked if they could introduce me to some women engineers, and they looked a bit oddly at me and said, well, half our undergraduate engineers the women who do you want to meet um and then i met some um older women professional engineers and in syria engineering has a really high status second only to medicine so if you did well in the maths and science <laughs> at school you would automatically if you possibly could go into medicine if you weren't quite didn't get quite the grade point average to get into medicine you would definitely go into engineering because families, middle-class families, saw that as a prestigious occupation for their girls. And that we're still struggling with that one. Mm. Yeah, interesting. My uh, daughter did civil engineering, um, which she never really wanted to go into when she'd finished. I think she found, <laughs> again, I th partly I think because of attitudes. Uh, you know, she could have been up. However, she finished up going working in the finance <laughs> sector. And they snatched her up. You're numerate, and mm -hmm. despite what people think, as an engineer, you are literate. Mm -hmm. You know about contract law. You know about this. You know about that. You know how things work. You're very practical, and you don't get mm. kind of browbeaten by people. And she's mm. done remarkably well. And well, lucky, lucky them to have her. Yeah. I was, at a, I was, I couldn't do anything because I, this was at a posh dinner, where the um, principal speaker was one of the ministers and she was saying oh how sad it was that you know so many bright girls go to university and they do uh, engineering they do science but then they don't go into science and engineering careers that is not a waste in my view because that engineering education means that wherever that young woman is working there are people there who are subliminally being guided as to whether things work or don't work. And there is somebody in the room, so you know, perhaps somebody, you know, an engineer has gone to be an accountant, there's somebody in the audit team who can ask the questions about whether that project was plausible or not um, in a way that only an engineer can ask. Even if that person never does engineering as such, that's not lost. No, I've uh, got a couple more questions. Sorry, uh, just Dave, one question. Dave, you've got a Dave Ross, you've got a question. I, I, I suppose my, my question is kind of looking forward, who who would you at this moment in time you say is sort of up and coming people that we should watch out for or, or are making kind of groundbreaking, you know, um, discoveries or, or movements in, in, in the in the sort of if you like women in engineering space? Hmm. Good question. I haven't got the answer. But just this week was this year's announcement of the Young Women Engineer of the Year Awards. Um, so there will be a raft of women in different categories. And those women, they do, go, they do go on to stand out because that experience of being one of, I don't know, half a dozen or whatever it is in different categories, Young Woman of the Engineer of the Year, gives them all sorts of exposure and mentoring and, and public speaking opportunities. Um, mm. I know several former um, young women engineers of the year, and they've they've all gone on to do interesting things. Um, and I, I haven't got any names for you. 
<laughs> That's great. And Bob, you, Bob Tottle, you had a question. Yes, yeah, I did. Yeah, thank you very much for the presentation, Nina. It was interesting. It was just that, you know, with it being um, Black Awareness Month, I wondered if you'd, uh, you know, if you'd come across any um, women of, uh, uh, of colour that had done interesting work in engineering, apart from at NASA. I mean, you did show the slide where there were two yeah, NASA yeah, women that yeah. were of colour. And of course, there was a famous film a couple of years ago um, uh, yeah. uh, made about the, the women yeah. of colour there. Yeah. But in yeah. Europe, maybe. Difficult one. <laughs> Not really until kind of the 1990s, and that's beyond. I don't normally do much work about living people. I mainly work on dead women. Um, and of the women of colour that I'm aware of in the sort of period I do look at, they're not British. Um, there were um, some of the first... Uh, women engineers in India, Indian women engineers um, were in the interwar period, um, also in countries like um, Egypt and Turkey, similarly. Um, Africa, from about the 1960s onwards, the Women's Engineering Society started to have members that were from abroad because they didn't have their own societies at that time. I, I am aware of them, but not in this country. Um, un, un, unlike perhaps um, some branches of engineering which had um, students of colour um, coming from the empire, the Commonwealth, um, they were all male. Um, so it's really only in recent times. I would say the Women's Engineering Society has a really high proportion of women of colour now, including on the board and, and um, in the young members board and so on. Um, very active and energetic young women. So not back in the time I'm really talking about, not in this country. Now, the only one I can think of um, is Maggie Aldrin Pocock, who's on Sky at Night, who's actually an engineer. Um, yeah. Yes, I mean certainly, you know, in 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 modern times there are plenty, um, but not not in the sort of historical period that I generally look at. Uh, the, one of the other problems with engineering, though, is, and it, this is not confined to women, blokes as well in the business. We tend to keep low profiles. Um, we are even the high flyers don't have a high profile anywhere. We never scream from the rooftops, hey. <laughs> we're great and all the rest of it so you're not you're not, not like politicians and the big finance people you know people in the media we just get a heads down and do the stuff we've got to do again, <laughs> you know. um, a, a related a related issue and I'm, i gave a talk to the local um, women's engineering society scotland group at the weekend um and this was about the lack of engineers of any gender um in film and fiction so if you think about TV soap operas, TV series generally, um, I bet everybody knows everything there is to know about every level of the criminal justice system in Britain and America, because there are uh, series awash, you know, CSI, um, Cell Block H, um, Law and Order, uh, NYPD, you know, every single thing you can think of about the criminal justice system, there are series coming out of your ears. Medical, the same, or hospital dramas and all the rest of it. But I couldn't think of a single um, TV series that even had one engineer in it, um, never mind one that was themed on engineering, until you get into the sort of Star Treks of this world. Um, where there are engineers doing some engineering, but it's really rare. Yeah. Um, so people aren't seeing them even in their entertainment, never mind in their serious lives. Well, that echoes what I say, really. You know, coming out with a line like, hey, I've just calculated the drag on the rear bumper. It really doesn't, <laughs> it's not really up there with <laughs> catching 25 criminals. <laughs> I think Jude's got a question. Jude? Hi, everyone. It's really, it's really nice. Your presentation is so beautiful. Uh, one question, although the balloon treat me a lot, 
Oh, sorry, Jude, you're... Jude, you I can't... Put, you're yeah, cutting out. The, the sound has stopped. Could you... It's really it? poor. Because I'm out in Saudi. Ah. Ah. <laughs> Jude, yes, could, you, could you type your question into the chat bit? I've done that already. Okay, where it, let me have I, a look. I can, I can read it. So Jude's okay. question is, how can the awareness of engineering be encouraged in the early years in women's education? How hmm. can the awareness of Well, I, I think this goes back to, to role models. Um, and there is, I'm trying to remember what it's called now, but it's the, uh, the Association of Black Engineers, but the, there is South Africa um, and Nigeria both, both have associations for women engineers. The, the, the American organization, Society of Women Engineers, has chapters in m most countries now. And I think getting um, young women to come in and talk to schools and the early years of degree courses about just their everyday you know, lives as engineers. I think that's really helpful to get a realistic um, but positive and upbeat account of the fun they're having being an engineer. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. And one last question, because I think we've, <laughs> we've been working you hard here. So there's a last question from Camilla Thompson. Are you, I'm just trying to see Camilla on, on my screen. Oh, yeah, I there can, you are. I can Hi. My face Hi, Camilla. <laughs> Hi, Nina. Um, yeah, so my question, I, actually I started off sort of thinking, should we start highlighting the role of female engineers when we introduce new topics in engineering? But actually maybe we should be, should we be offering courses on the history of engineering um, as a whole um, in schools of engineering, where we could highlight particularly the women, but also some of the other forgotten engineers. Mm. Are you an academic yourself, Camilla? Yeah, I'm at the School of Edinburgh, I'm at the University of Edinburgh. Well, the reason I ask is that um, an attempt was made to set up um, a master's course at Glasgow and it didn't go anywhere, there didn't seem to be the interest in it. Um, in other countries, I mean, in America, the history, um, history and philosophy of engineering is commonplace and may, for all I know, it's a requirement. Um, and whenever this is raised with the accrediting bodies, you know, like IMEC or the civils or the structurals or whoever, they say, oh, well, um, it's sort of covered in each thing. So when you begin thermo, there'll be a bit, bit about the history of thermodynamics and the early um, discoverers of this, that and the other principle. And it's left at that. So other countries do do it. France does it, America does it, um, I think Germany, as separate required modules. And typically history and philosophy are lumped together, often with a bit of ethics thrown in. And for some reason, the institutions in this country um, don't want to do that. They say, oh, the degrees are already so crammed full of stuff, we don't want to require something else. But other countries do it, so I don't know why we wouldn't. Um, uh, there's, I, I've read some very interesting American books written for the, that um, requirement, um, and the equivalent doesn't exist here at all. So I think you make a really interesting point um, that most engineers know, unless they have a, an interest in history, most engineers have very little understanding of the history of their own in industry, in my experience. I was, uh, the question came up because I was looking at some, I was redesigning a course where we talk about wind power and, and it starts with the Romans. Um, but it just mentions that the Romans used wind power. Um, and it, it, so it's this thing of like, we don't, even there, we don't talk about any individuals. Um, in the historic history of the development of modern wind and wind energy. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, I, I pass. I pass the ball back to you, Camilla. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I've done this call as well, so we could discuss it later. <laughs> so, all right. Thank you. And at the, at, at the risk of embarrassing Camilla, could I just note that Camilla was named one of the country's top fifty women, women engineers earlier oh. this year. Very good.
Okay, well, it's nearly eight o'clock, so I think we, we, should, uh, we should draw the formal part of the evening to a conclusion. Um, I'll say a few words of thanks, Nina. Uh, there are many types of historian, and they're usually identified by some sort of prefix, you know, Roman historians, medieval historians, military historians. But this evening, we've been fortunate to have an independent historian uh, presenting to us. Now, when people are described as independent, it often means that they have their own interests and approaches that they don't quite uh, they don't follow a crowd. So I think it's a very appropriate way of describing the contents of this evening's lecture. And a speaker has revealed a hidden history that's sort of parallel to the events that we know well and have been reported by lots of other people. But what we've had this evening is unique, and I think particularly impressive because of the depth of the investigation. These aren't facts or images that uh, are easily found on Google that pop up from a, a casual search. I think each one has had to be tracked down and the jigsaws pieced together um, from various sources. So we've been treated to a presentation that is quite unique and informative. And we go away better educated, not just about women, but about many things. I will no longer have to lose sleep wondering how many cow hides are needed to make a Zeppelin. And I understand the link between textiles and uh, space exploration, and even the definition of clear air turbulence, which is all new. So let's thank our speaker in, for a fascinating presentation. My pleasure. And our thank you. <laughs> Next speaker, I think it's our next event is on the 10th of November when we've got uh, Dr. Alam from Edinburgh University is giving a talk about biomimetics, uh, engineers, a biologist, engineering through the eyes of a biologist or perhaps the other way around. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Do any of the, the committee want to stay behind? Was there anything, Paul, that we felt we should be discussing. Can I point out you're still recording, Jonathan? Yeah, I'm just trying to find where the stop recording <laughs> button is. <laughs>